Welcome back to the live coverage of the Real News Network from Washington, D.C. We're in the McClatchy offices, and we are talking to Ralph Nader, who is uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, Ralph Nader, after, after doing one of these marathon campaign events, is already starting on November the 5th. Uh, it makes me tired even thinking about what you do, mm -hmm. Nader. Uh, we're also joined by Tom Morris and Bill Fletcher. Uh, Ralph, uh, we, we, uh, we were just talking about what exactly is the mandate. What, uh, I, I, would, I would say there is a mandate. The mandate is essentially what he campaigned for, which is a fairly conventional set of policies. Uh, you said re uh, when we ended that he wouldn't invite you as an advisor. Um, just a meeting. So, so <laughs> have you asked? Uh, I'm the canary bird. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Bill, you wanted to talk more about the mandate. Why don't you pick it up? Yeah. See, I think... Um that this is the way I see the mandate, that if Obama is elected, and I'm still in that if camp, because to me, it ain't over till it's over, um, it is that people want someone that is going to look out for the regular working person and address the economy, and they secondly want a change in the relationship of the United States to the rest of the world. It's at that vague level, but it's significant. And why I say it's significant is that it represents it's clearly a rejection of Bush and the uh, September 2002 National Security Strategy Doctrine. But it also actually represents a rejection of Clinton. Um, because, because what we're looking at right now is not simply economic devastation brought on by eight years of Bush. It's eight years of Clinton, Bush the first, and Reagan, all that whole thing. And there's this... There's Which has this, given us this financial meltdown. Given us this financial meltdown. meltdown um, and, and, but also paved the way for U.S. adventurism overseas. I mean, it's not just mm -hmm. Bush's madness mm -hmm. um, that we have to look at. So there's this very partially defined, I'd say, desire, quote, man, slash mandate that I believe he will have. Now, the problem is that there's insufficient levels of organization at the base. And one of the reasons that I remain committed to the union movement is that I feel like the unions, and why they have to transform, is that the unions need to be one of the forces that gets next to him and pushes him and does not do what was done under Clinton. Under Clinton, they caved in. Yeah. They caved in, they demobilized. Uh, when welfare repeal took place, they basically issued a press release. No mobilization, no educating our members about what the implications were, right? There was a fear of criticizing Clinton because, quote unquote, it would give ammunition to the enemy. Well, look, folks, if Obama's elected, the enemy is going to be sharpening their knives. The right wing populists are going to be out there, they're going to be stirring things up. But the problem is that if we hold back in criticism of Obama, he will continue to move to the right. I mean, there's just absolutely no question. And, his, and, and I think that Ralph is right, that the rhetoric, and this is one issue I, I also disagreed with, uh, with uh, Senator Obama, his rhetoric of accommodation, while rhetorically quite interesting and perhaps tactically useful, is ahistorical. And, and part of what I think that is necessary from people like Ralph, from the labor movement, uh, from others, is to emphasize that it really is struggle that brings about change. And struggle is very difficult. And it's very unsettling for many people. But it's what we have to remind people after this election. I think also he's going to be up against the intelligence apparatus of the country is going to be very resistant to change. Now, we may all around this table know that Guantanamo Bay and torture of people and you know, eliminating habeas corpus and all the things that have been done over the last eight years are wrong. But he's still going to have to deal with an entrenched national security apparatus, the, and they are backed by the economic hitmen, if you will, who have a completely different agenda, no matter who's in the White House. And he's going to have to have people around him who can help undo that resistance. And that's not going to be easy. Mm. You know, it's interesting. He has a very easy act to follow. 
So he's going to, it's easy for him to, to, to sound well, good. Well, we were, we were saying that and, before, that yeah, essentially yeah. conventional politics seems yeah. radical next to the last eight years. Yeah. yeah. But notice the third debate. When McCain was baiting him as to whether he's going to be soft on the military activities abroad, he met McCain head on in everything. Belligerent language to Iran. Belligerent language to Russia. S complete support for the militaristic repression and colonization by the Israeli government. I'm going to do something on camera, which people, people don't usually do. But you got a bug on your shoulder. Oh dear! And it's not from the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> he's proved that he's for the environment. He brings nature with him wherever he goes. And wants more soldiers in Afghanistan, which is a real misreading of culture. He's, he likes to say he's got a Kenyan father uh, and he knows third world cultures. But you do not, you do not conquer these people. This has got to be diplomacy. It's got to be public well, works. And and his idea of withdrawing from Iraq is a minimum of keeping 50,000 soldiers there and the bases. So you see, all the signs are not good. How much has he campaigned in Latino and African American areas? He was up there all over the country with all the cameras. He could have paid, brought such attention to poor areas in this country, and he didn't do it. And you know, it, it, it's, like, it's like he is putting forth his own mandate, and he's gonna say to the people, uh, here was my mandate. I told you about what I was going to do, foreign affairs, increase the military budget, bail out the Wall Street swindlers and crooks. <laughs> That's the way he's going to interpret it. The question is, who's going to pull in the direction of the uh, necessities of the people because the four corporations are pulling 27, uh, 427 but in is, the other is direction? Is there something, a, a kind of a, a new situation? Mm. The extent of this financial meltdown and economic crisis is, seems like it's going to be so profound that it's really uncharted waters for everybody, including all the financial elite and all yeah. of the elite. And, and so in, in a sense, he, if he actually does want to do something transformational, he's in a situation where they're going to have to do something brand new. Or it becomes a straitjacket and he can't do anything except, you know, ride the slide down. That's the key. The key is his personality. You know, Heraclitus, the ancient philosopher, once said, character is destiny. Mm. And I would say personality is decisive. He does not have a challenging personality. He doesn't speak truth and democratic power, you know, organizing people, to plutocratic power. And that's the power of the rich and the powerful. Well, the, the one argument you can make is that Obama got elected and Ralph Nader didn't. You could say, mm. You're not play hating. You're not play hating, are you? <laughs> you, need no, to, you need to speak this way, no. and then it comes down to I think a lot of what you were yeah. saying. Uh, even if one wants to read all these things into his candidacy, and I don't know that you can, mm. then it does come down to so far his advisors are all the same old, same old advisors. That's we haven't seen anything fresh and new here. That's the first tip uh, that you'll get. You'll see who he surrounds himself with, and look, the problem is he has no competition from the left. I mean, I, I went into this campaign knowing that uh, I was going to be kept off the debates, even though every national poll from 2000 wanted me by name. Okay, so that means you don't reach tens of millions of people. If you're not scheduled on the debates, the national media won't cover you, New York Times, the networks, Washington Post, in April, May, June, July, August, because they say you don't have a chance. You're not a mega billionaire like Pro mm -hmm. can put ads on. And then the third thing that happens is we're drained during the summer just trying to get on the ballot, because no country in the Western world obstructs voters and obstructs candidates the way our country does with these draconian state laws enacted by the two parties. We have a two-party dictatorship in this country, let's face it. And, and it is a dictatorship in thraldom to these giant corporations who control every department agency in the federal government, including the Department of Labor. I mean, this is, this is how far it's gone. We have a corporate state. Franklin Delano Roosevelt put it very well in 1938 in a message to Congress. He said, when government is controlled by private economic power, he said, quote, that's fascism, end quote. That's the definition of fascism. Um, and, and look at every big industry now. Screwing the average let me, guy. Let me ask you. I gotta, screwing the average guy is going for bail. I've got a break in just a few yeah. seconds. you want to come back for another segment or do you have to go? We'll come back for another segment. All right. We're going to come back for another segment. Join us in a couple of minutes with Ralph Nader.